Being able to see an avalanche cycle that's maybe a 100 year or potentially 300 year return rate is a pretty amazing experience. That being said, if I had a choice of not to see it, uh, now I might take that. <laughs> My name is Ethan Green and I'm the director of the Colorado Avalanche Information Center. Today we're at the Colorado Mountain College in Leadville, Colorado with the Powder Cloud to talk about the historic avalanche cycle in Colorado in March of 2019. The events of March of last year uh, were really the progression of the entire winter and the development of the snowpack in, in Colorado. We can really break it into kind of three events. Early season snowfall in October that developed our weak layer, this consistent snowfall in January and February that built this strong mid-pack, and then that system got overloaded by some very intense storms in early March. So when you look at those three events, um, none of them were completely unusual or unprecedented. They were all sort of had this characteristic that, that we don't see that often, but what led to this avalanche cycle was having them all together in one season. So moving through February, we had actually stopped seeing a lot of activity in deeper weak layers. And we had mostly been seeing avalanches on uh, surface ore and near surface faceted layers that were higher up in the snowpack. Towards the end of February, we had really taken all the, the deep basal layers off of the list of, uh, of our problems. And then we started to see those storms in uh, in the forecast, this sort of intense atmospheric river event, uh, the potential for some sustained uh, precipitation. And that's when we started thinking a little bit more about those weak layers and anticipating that we would be uh, going to high and potentially uh, issuing some avalanche warnings. The snowpack was, uh, was fairly deep for what we see in Colorado, but again, not unordinary. Uh, looking at the peak accumulation, we were around 120 to 130 percent of the long-term record. The, the storms that really kicked off this avalanche cycle started around the 28th of February. We started to see the first large avalanches around the 3rd of March, and those continued until around the 14th of March, which is when we saw the last avalanche that we would classify as a destructive size 5. There's a few unusual aspects of this avalanche cycle. One of them is the large number of large avalanches over a large area of Colorado. When you look back at some of the historic avalanche cycles, and really some of the documented avalanche cycles in Colorado that people would uh, describe as extreme events, they typically involve less than half of the avalanche paths in a particular area, and they're often confined to one portion of the Colorado mountains. We saw avalanches large enough to destroy major plots of timber uh, over a fairly significant portion of Colorado, uh, from the north around Winter Park and then extending through the Central Mountains and into the San Juans down towards Durango. In some parts of Colorado, uh, we saw maybe upwards of 90% of the avalanche paths in a small area running in a very large manner. So there's work that's being done now to really understand the historic nature of this avalanche cycle and to place it firmly in the trajectory of history. But we do have a few events that we can look at, sort of anecdotal evidence that helps us understand it. One is the Disney slide path on Berthoud Pass. This is an avalanche path that was named for an accident that happened with a photographer from Walt Disney. They came out in the 50s, approached the then Colorado Department of Highways about filming avalanches, and they set up uh, to film it at the base of the avalanche path while the highway department uh, triggered an avalanche. They placed the photographer in a place where they had never seen an avalanche uh, reach before, and unfortunately the avalanche was much larger than anyone expected and killed the photographer and one highway worker. That happened in 1957. Uh, since then, it's been part of our uh, avalanche safety program with CDOT, where we monitor it, and, uh, and CDOT performs uh, active mitigation in that path. Um, but it's never hit the road until this year. 
So that puts us in about that 60 year sort of return rate. We also uh, saw an avalanche naturally run in the 10 Mile Canyon area off of Peak One. This particular avalanche overran the boundaries and blew out a huge area of forest. Everybody had looked at it as a new avalanche path until somebody dug through some historic uh, photographs and found a photograph dated 1899 that shows almost an identical trim line. So that puts us maybe in the 100 year sort of return rate. And then the last one is a, a historic structure in uh, Hinsdale County outside of Lake City called the Rose Lime Kiln. It was built in the 1880s and survived until this cycle when it was hit by an avalanche and the 40-foot stack was knocked off the top of it. And so that puts us at about a 130, 140 year uh, return rate. So in order to understand the cycle, we've collaborated with some people in the Forest Service and at the USGS. We have these ideas of how historic this is, uh, but to try to put some numbers uh, attached to that. Some of the work we did this summer was collecting samples from the trees that were destroyed during these avalanches. You can see the, the history of avalanches in some of these paths in the signals in the tree rings. And so we collected a lot of uh, data that we'll be sorting through over the next probably few years. The other part of uh, our job is to really support uh, other government agencies in Colorado. And so that's something that we uh, have been doing, but I think when I start to meet with people and talk to them about land use planning, uh, building in certain areas, what they want to be thinking about, how they want to anticipate that, that's something that we'll certainly be trying to educate people about and trying to provide really good information. And that's part of the reason that we've partnered with uh, some researchers to really look at this avalanche cycle a little bit more in depth so we can understand the historic nature of it and provide the best information for people that are trying to make decisions about where to spend government funds, how to build communities, um, how we really interface with the mountains. I think uh, some of the things that we did well um, was anticipating sort of the, the widespread nature of this uh, cycle. Maybe not the way that it actually played out, but the potential for it to impact a huge portion of the Colorado mountains. And getting that information out in avalanche warnings, we ended up putting out an extreme avalanche danger, so level five out of five, which is uh, pretty unusual for us to put out at all. We put it out over four zones, which is really the entire central mountains of Colorado, and that's something that we've never done before. People really started to uh, think outside of the box and figure out who we needed to call to get those messages out to people. So when you start to look at the impacts that the cycle had of the people in Colorado, there, there were three people that got killed. Um, there were 23 uh, involvements. Uh, it was not insignificant, but the fact that there, it wasn't worse uh, is partly luck and partly, I would hope, due to our efforts. Well, I think in uh, events like this where you're really faced with um, very stressful events, maybe unprecedented, uh, you really do fall back on your procedures and, uh, and training. Um, and I'm very proud of the work that the group of people I work with at the Colorado Avalanche Information Center did during this time. It really showed the level of professionalism of the team and what they are capable of. A lot of what we dealt with during this time was risk management. We, we knew that we were dealing with uh, a significant hazard. Exactly how it was going to uh, play out in different places at different times was something that we were trying to anticipate but was really difficult to do. It sort of moved outside of the recreational piece into um, a, a wider spread public safety uh, effort. And so a lot of what we spent time doing was, we knew what the hazard was, we spent time figuring out how to communicate it to people and how to be proactive in reaching out to people that maybe wouldn't be thinking about this on most days, but really needed to uh, during this time frame. A lot of events in this two week period will not leave me anytime soon. Part of it for me was just the sustained nature of it. You know, certainly walking on the debris piles where the cars were buried on Highway 91, 
walking up the avalanche path in Twin Lakes after it did overrun the road and destroyed a power line coming from a path that wasn't in our atlas as a mapped hazard to the roadway. Um, being down in Lake City and looking at the home that was destroyed there and uh, some of the buildings that were damaged, those are moments I'll never forget. Being able to see an avalanche cycle that's maybe a 100 year or potentially 300 year return rate, something that not everybody gets to, to witness and to witness it up close and personal is a, is a pretty amazing experience. That being said, if I had a choice of not to see it, uh, now I might take that. <laughs> I hope that the visibility of this avalanche cycle and the work that the center does uh, gets more people involved in avalanche safety in Colorado. Uh, and that can manifest in a lot of different ways. Some of it could be uh, being involved in community events, uh, supporting the Friends of the CAIC, which is our nonprofit partner, but really just having avalanches be more front and center uh, in people's minds in the wintertime. That's what we do. That's what we're trying to do every day in the winter. And so if this event uh, and uh, the exposure that the center's work got uh, helps in that effort, um, that would be a tremendous uh, boon for us.